Okay, so I, I want to welcome everybody and um, thank Julia and Rabbi for, a, you know, allowing this uh, series to go and being so supportive of it. They've been absolutely fabulous in all the arrangements, and I thank you. Um, and of course, Sheila Kaufman for her tech support. Sheila's been working with me as my tech support uh, since we started the How to Live Forever series uh, during the pandemic. So thank you again, Sheila. Um, it, it's a really exciting night, um, which will be a chance to clarify wh why we do what we do today as we understand our history from yesterday. Um, throughout the series, uh, we're going to look back, and it's a series of four parts, on 100 plus years of Women's League's history. We're going to examine its important organizational milestones, its challenges and successes, innovations, resources, and publications, cultural creativity, social activism, polit political advocacy, and tumultuous, very tumultuous religious change. Tonight, um, we're going to present part one, historical overview, which will be an exploration of the 100 plus years of Women's League, uh, a fascinating look at its history from foundation in 1918 to the present, or almost to the present. We will be breaking a couple of times during the presentation for questions, and then we will also allow for questions at the end. Um, you are in for a treat. Our teacher is Lisa Ellison, formerly Kogan, and she is no stranger to Women's League. Lisa served as the Women's League Director of Education and Program from 2003 to 2017. During that time, she helped to create educational and programmatic innovations, reflective of the organization's longstanding mission. Since her retirement, and moved to Atlanta. Lisa continues to teach and lecture on subjects near and dear to her heart. One of which is the scope and importance of women's contributions to contemporary Jewish history. Over the years, Lisa has become my valued friend, very valued friend. Together, we spent hours on the phone discussing and reminiscing the amazing changes in the world over the last century. And we call each other fellow history nerds. It is a joy to listen to and learn from Lisa. And I'm so grateful to her for sharing her knowledge with us all tonight. Lisa, thank you and welcome. You're muted. Still? Am I now unmuted? You are. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I've been not saying anything or, or, or uh, chiming in here because I have to say I'm a little verklempt seeing so many friends here. Um, so many. It's almost, I, I hope I'm going to be able to get past this first piece. Um, I've, missed the, I've missed you and I'm just so happy to see so many of you. I'm not going to name names because uh, that you always get into trouble when you do that. But you all know who you are. And I have loved working with you and I really respect the work that you continue to do. And I would like to thank, before I start, they always say, do your thank yous and your apologies at the beginning because you never know who's gonna leave. Um, and so, uh, first of all, I am going to just do a reciprocal thank you to Corey. Um, who is uh, just continues to amaze me on a daily basis. Her 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 tenacity and her love for this material is is endless and it's laudatory. And working with Corey is is also a joy. And um, it's really we owe Women's League owes a huge debt of thanks to both past presidents, Selma Weintraub and Corey for their work on the Women's League archives without which so much of our history would be lost. So much, I can't even emphasize that enough. So thank you, Corey. 
And thank you to Julia and thank you to Rabbi Ellen, all of you for who have helped to make this happen tonight. Now I wanna start, uh, before I, I, I put up the PowerPoint presentation, I just wanna make a couple other comments. And this falls into the, uh, you know, the apology category. Um, unfortunately, because of time constraints, I'm gonna have to give very short shrift to a lot of subjects. Um, and if I offend any of you because you think something I have given short shrift to is important, trust me, if you think it's important, I also think it's important. And I'm just sorry that I had to cut short. But you know, at some other point, maybe we can go into some of these things in a deeper dive. I also want to say that most of the focus of tonight's program is going to be up to 1972, but there's also going to be there's going to be discussion about beyond 1972. But many of the initiatives um, from 1972 on um, are going to be the focus of a subsequent session. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight. And the other thing I want to say before we start is that um, there is, alas, a very serious, scant, a, a scant amount of material um, other than the archives um, about women's league history. And there's a lot in the archives, but it, the archives covers a lot of very kinds of eccentric material, a, a lot of, I mean, I spent hours and hours in the archives the last uh, last week and a half, just reading about thank you notes for Lee Grams and how many books were sold and how, which sisterhoods paid their dues and which sisterhoods didn't pay their dues. But there's a lot of history that has been lost. And some of that history was lost from, in the move from JTS and um, the move, and then the, the move to ninety to seventy fourth Street, and then the flood that happened in seventy fourth Street. And there were huge numbers of materials that were lost there, and then even more materials were lost again in an, in another move. And so, unfortunately, there is a lot of our history that is just going has been has been buried, been washed away, has been forgotten, and that's you know that's that's very unfortunate. And so, but we are still able to construct a fair amount of interesting, fascinating history. Um, and so I'm going to present tonight just a very cursory view of this incredibly rich storied history of this organization that we all love. And I know that an hour and a half is very fleeting. And so I'm going to get, I'm going to get going. Um, I'm going to now put up a PowerPoint, pre, uh, my PowerPoint. So you're not going to see me. I'm, you're just going to see the PowerPoint, but I hope you will all be able to hear me and let us commence. We're going to stop periodically for questions. So hold on to your questions. Um, and then uh, Corey is going to break periodically and we'll see if there's anything that you want to look at at or discuss, um, but we can't go into anything in real deep uh, detail tonight. So here we go. I'm going to get into this, I hope. Keep your fingers crossed. How's that? Can you see? Yes. Great. OK. So this is, of course, the intro, which I named. I thought this was very. Uh, it's something that would resonate with all of us, a league of our own. Uh, so I don't see anything. I don't see anything except for you, Lisa. Uh, we don't see anything, Lisa. Sh Just oh, you. Well, where's my share? Uh-oh. Okay, share wait a screen. minute. All right, I've got to do my share screen. Hold on. Yep. Hold on. Sorry. All right, Sheila, you may have to talk me through this. Hold on. Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. You got it? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see here. Okay, share screen. Here we go. Here we go. How's that? Perfect. Great. Okay, wait a minute, though. I want to just do something else here. Just a minute, Sheila. I go want to get... go down to the bottom where you yeah. have. Um, bottom right, right to the yep. left, next to the yep. minus. Hit that button. It looks like a, I don't know, something, <laughs> a popsicle. Um, it's on the bottom of my screen. 
yeah, go to um, where it, you can enlarge it a little bit. Um, well, I, I, wait a minute. I, I can, What happens when I do this? Because this is what I had practiced. Let me just see here. Lisa, do, go to sh slideshow. Go to slideshow. Go up to slideshow. I'm going, is that in home or is that in file? It's on your task bar. But it's also on the bottom. Okay, whatever. I keep. Oh, I see. Here we go. Slide control. Yeah, you can go into view also. Hmm. Oh, I see view. Okay. Yeah, get, click on that. Lisa on the right. I and see it. Is. I see it. No. Uh, where does she go to? This is a new computer. Let's see. No, go to. All right. I, to I, know, I know on the bottom you can do it. Or yeah, go in, if you want to try slideshow. Go to slideshow, Lisa. It's All right. It's, I'm looking. I'm looking for where slideshow it's is. Same, it's, it's in the same line as view. It's in that task bar to the. the yeah, uh, I see it. Okay. It. Go to the left. There it is. Got it. Okay. From beginning. Click on it. No, click on it again. Click on click on slideshow again. Slideshow. Yeah. And yeah, click on it and go to from beginning all the way to the left. Got it. Let's see if that how's works. that. There you go. Is that, is that it? Yep. Sorry about that. Okay. All right, you got that? Now we're good. We're good. Everybody good? Okay. Okay. I just want to get rid of this over here. Okay. So you can see here, I've got a the, the Jewish population of the United States and why this is important for this discussion. Um, it's important to understand where how many Jews were here and where they came from. And the most important dates that we have to look at at seven from 17 in 1790, which was right around the time of the American Revolution, there were no more than a th at most 2000 Jews living in all of the colonies. And most of the Jews that were here at that point were Sephardic Jews or Jews of Sephardic descent who had come either from England or from places that had been settled by the Dutch Republic. Um, the first Jews arrived uh, from Recife, uh, Brazil in, uh, in 1654. Um, and so at that point, these say 2,000, 20, 2,200 Jews who lived here um, there were just a, a few synagogues in the United States, and most of them practiced what we would call the Sephardic Rite. There were also, at that point, there were no rabbis here. So all of the people here that were religious of, officiants were people who were just, you know, people who were who were learned in, in, in Judaism and could read Torah and could adjudicate Jewish issues, but there were no rabbis. And then starting in about the year 1820, after a group, a number of riots broke out in Germany, these Hep Hep riots, they were called, a, a significant number of Jews started to emigrate, to immigrate to the United States from the central, central countries of Europe. Um, they were mostly young men. And for a particular reason why young men left, I don't want to go into that, but there were mostly young men, not nearly as many young women. Um, these were not yet what we would call chain um, immigrations because only the, generally the men came by themselves. Many of these are the, the men that you hear about who were the itinerant uh, the itinerant peddlers who went out to all different parts of the country, selling things from their, you know, from packs and from suitcases. And these are the, by the way, these are the same men who grew that, you know, they went from, from a, a, a suitcase to a, to a, to a wagon, to a small store and to some of the big stores and some of the large department stores that we know today in the United States started with these immigrants who came from, Ger uh, from Germany in the mid century. And so by 1880, there were about 250,000 Jews living in the United States. Most of them at this point are Ashkenazim. And these are Jews who have now come and who have brought with them what we would call liberal Judaism. 
um, it came in the United States to be known as Reformed Judaism, but these are Jews, and, and through these Jews, they began to develop a number of very important institutional structures, organizational structures that have that continue on down today, including at that point, you know, Hebrew Union College, which was uh, which was established by Isaac Mayer Wise many Jewish institutions and a lot of organizations of uh, uh, beginning of women's organizations that we would call social organizations, self-help organizations. And then in 1881, um, and by the way, the largest mass of Jews in at the end of the 19th century lived in Eastern Europe. And at that point, the population of Eastern Europe was well over 5 million Jews. And that had grown from a century before by almost a four million, four by four million. There was a huge population explosion in that century. But in 1881, a couple, there were a number of factors that led to this massive immigration from Eastern Europe. First of which was the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, which was attributed to Jewish revolutionaries and a series of pogroms broke out. And there was a, there was a lot of destruction. There was more destruction than actual, uh, than actual murder of Jews, but it was very traumatic for Jews. But the, the overarching reason for why Jews left Europe, Eastern Europe at the end of the 19th century was because of staggering poverty and lack of opportunity for Jews to make entree into any of the, uh, any of the um, areas of commerce other than their own particular areas of commerce. And so Jews really began, as did other immigrants come to the United States because it was made very clear that America was the place for opportunity, tremendous opportunity for anyone. And that was the principal reason why most this huge number of Jews began to come in, hundreds, thousands and thousands of Jews yearly. And as you can see how the population grew from 1881, from where, where you had in 1880, 250,000 Jews, to 1905, you had a million and a half Jews. And by 1914, almost 3 million Jews. And then in 1924, with the passage of the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, the doors of, of immigration for a variety of, of reasons were slammed shut and that very much curtailed immigration from uh, of Jews from all over Europe, not just Jew, not um, not just Jews, but the Irish, Italians, um, uh, and all of these immigration, all of these huge numbers of immigrants were curtailed. Why this is important is because this largest influx of Jews from Eastern Europe was going to make up the core of what would become conservative Jews in the United States. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna come back to this in a little while. But the, the rise of conservative Judaism actually began in, in, in Central Europe, in Breslau, it's probably a name that a number of you will recognize, which was where there was a very famous uh, and he was a, he was a great scholar and, and Frankel's principal concern was the critical, the critical study of history. And why that's important is because Frankel saw that history was actually evolutionary. It wasn't, it was not stationary. And why this was important was because Frankel was of the, of the belief that while Judaism had to maintain its historic, its historical roots, 
that nevertheless needed to, it, it also changed with time and it adapted with time. And these adaptations were done in a positive way and they didn't just throw things out willy nilly because they weren't convenient, but changes were embraced because they were seen to be consistent with the times, but also consistent with Jewish tradition, which is why it came to be called positive historical Judaism. It was historical Judaism, but they maintained a positive approach to it in the retention of that which was important and, and, and sort of curtailing some kinds of customs that perhaps had become somewhat uh, less appropriate for, for Jews to be observing at that time. I can't go into all of the, the social and cultural background of, of emancipation in, uh, in Europe, but trust me, uh, all of these movements of, of these reformist movements that began in 19th century, in 19th century Europe, it's particularly in Germany, filtered into uh, the United States through the, the rise of denominationalism that was even observed here in the United States. But Frankel is considered to be in some ways sort of the progenitor of what became historical Judaism. So now I wanna talk about women in the United States up, up to this point, up to the point of the development, uh, the rise of conservative Judaism. Um, and I call this women who don't do lunch because what we're really talking about is these powerhouse women who absolutely, um, they embraced their new lives in the United States and they uh, embarked upon all kinds of new initiatives and, and really were trailblazers in, in changing in, in very important ways the lives of women in the United States. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna just for a minute look at what were some of these important transformative uh, matters for about women at the end of the 19th century in the early 20th century. Understand at the end of the 19th century, just before we begin to see this influx of Jews from Eastern Europe, there are uh, there one of the very important uh, phenomena that is that 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 occurs is after the Civil War, with the death of huge with the deaths of huge numbers of men in uh, during in the Civil War on both sides both sides of the uh, of the conflict, there was a large number huge number of women who were left widows. And, um, and obviously they were left widows and there weren't a lot of men for, you know, even for the purposes of remarriage. So these women were women who were actually forced to confront their new, their new reality. And these are women who became, you know, who had to go out and, you know, who had to go out and work. They had to go out and provide for their families. These were women who, who had to emerge from their homes where they had been ensconced and they had to they had to go out and develop new strategies for taking care of their families. Sometimes um, the marriage patterns, as I had you know talked about, alluded to earlier, there was a very big change, particularly among the German the German Jews, because as I said early on in immigration, the most of the people, most of the immigrants who came here initially were men. So these men who came here, there weren't women for them to marry. And so they had to go out in search of women and there weren't Jewish women for them to marry. So many, a relatively large number of Jewish men in the late 1800s um, married out. They married, you know, approximately 25% of these men married out because they, uh, they, they, they couldn't find Jewish wives, especially the men who, who traveled way into the hinterlands of the United States and married women from wherever they settled down. And so this, this intermarriage of Jews was a new phenomenon. Um, and as I said, uh, certainly by the end, by mid, middle, late 1800s, probably 25% of, of Jewish men in particular 
had uh, undergone intermarriage. This was a much larger percentage, by the way, than Jewish women who married out. Jewish women, first of all, Jewish women did not have the opportunities to, um, to go out in search of husbands. This was not socially acceptable. A man could leave the house and go out and look for a wife. This was not the prerogative of women who, if they lived in a small town and there were, there were you know, the, the Manas family in the South, for example, where they had five daughters and there were no options for any of these daughters to marry and they, they all ended up remaining single. And so this was a common, a common pattern for women at the end of the 19th century. I'm really talking about women from Eastern, Eastern uh, from, from Central Europe. But at, it's important to point out that the stigma of being single was beginning to erode. And so once upon a time when a, you know, a family had a, a, a daughter who didn't marry, it was, oi, nebach, you know, what are we going to do with our poor, you know, with our poor Sarah, you know, she's going to be forever, you know, left as a spinster. But the reality is that the, by, with these new social organizational patterns, there was a there was a very important role for unmarried women to play. And we are going to see, especially uh, in moving into the 20th century, unmarried women who are going to take positions, uh, in, in very important positions outside of the home. Another important factor is the changing mortality for women. Women were living longer. They were by 1850, uh, up until 1850, believe it or not, many women had died by the age of 40 for a variety of reasons. Um, by 1900, it had that, that, that had jumped, that had improved by 25%. Um, and, and, by 19, and uh, by 1900, that improved by about 25%. And by 1920, the average age of the age of, of mortality for women was 57 years old. So the consequences of this is that women were did no longer in most of their lives spent their spent their lives uh, bearing children and raising children. Women who who lived beyond the age of 45 or 50 were no longer tied up with matters of you know family concern so they now had the opportunity to go out into out into the world and to do things other than merely raising their children um, and that's not to to diminish what that what what that um, what, what, how important that was. But there were also for women's lives there were all kinds of new labor saving devices too that 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 factored very much into their lives, you know, electricity and telephones, running water in their homes. And even, even as these impoverished women came into, into the tenements in New York, they already had running water. You didn't have to go out and schlep water to your house. You had refrigeration now. Even, even people who didn't have a lot of money, these immigrants from Eastern Europe had some kinds of refrigeration. They had canned foods. Um, and you know, already by the 20th century, you began to see all kinds of labor-saving devices. They had ringer washing machines, and they had irons. And so, a lot of these these tasks that women had to spend entire days doing had now been improved by social by all kinds of uh, improvements to women's lives. And so, once women were freed up from childbearing and from you know the round the clock toil in their houses, women could now focus many more of their energies on things outside of outside of their own their their own lives. And at that point, we are going to begin to see the rise of these what we, what is called in both the non-Jewish and the Jewish world, these women's clubs. And women now had the opportunity to join these clubs, which initially started out as kinds of social, organizations where they would go and they would they would read books or they would listen to music or they would they would talk about per social current events but eventually and very quickly these women's clubs became other focused and they developed they soon developed into societies into groups that that really talked about improving themselves and the world around them 
And they be and through these clubs, women began to de develop other kinds of skills besides the domestic skills that they had grown up with. And so they began to develop all kinds of administ administrative skills and financial skills and even political know-how. And for Jewish women, these act these active for Jewish women in particular, these activities over and above the fact that they had a social element to them, they also had a they had a religious element to them. And Jewish women saw these organizations that were there that were going to help to conserve Judaism, that they were going to be there to safeguard their values, and they were going to rise to the future. And women saw their activities as extending their homes into the public arena. And Jewish women in particular extended many of these activities in their clubs and these organizations into three pillars, which were philanthropy, the synagogue, and Zionism. And so it is into this that we now see the rise of uh, of women's league but we but the background of this is the development of a few jewish women's organizations um the first you will know of course be familiar with all the names of all of these the national council of jewish women that grew out of the the um the world's fair in chicago in 1893 the National Council of Jewish Women, you can see her here in the upper right hand corner, the, the founder of this was uh, Hannah, Hannah Solomon. And um, initially, the National Council of Jewish Women was their, their, their objective was to combat assimilation and educate Jewish women. They established study groups where they were studying all kinds of Jewish issues, but very soon their they changed their mission and their mission began to focus only on the progressive initi initiatives that were now very much in vogue by other women's organizations in the early 20th century. And they basically disbanded the, the study of Judaism um, and Jewish, Jewish religion as their pr primary focus and they focused more on social issues. The second, uh, you will certainly rec recognize um, Hadassah, which grew out of um, the very the interest, especially of the Jews who came from Eastern Europe, of their interest in Zionism and the promotion of a of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Henrietta Zold, of course, is a name you will all be familiar with. She's a daughter. She is herself the daughter of a a German a German rabbi. Um, she studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary, was one of the first women to study there. Uh, in the early uh, 20th century, she went to Palestine with her mother, called Palestine in those days, or it's known as the Yeshuv by Jews. It's a Jewish set, the settlement of, of Jews prior to the state of Israel. And she was appalled by the conditions there. And she came back, especially, you know, about the conditions in which children lived and the very unsanitary, unhygienic conditions and the disease. And she came back and she 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 immediately set about um, creating an organization of of uh, uh, promoting Zion, Zionism for women, and among the early founders, there were seven. There were several of seven of them, who were the early founders of the Hadassah of Hadassah, and one of whom was her very good dear friend Matilda Schachter. The the final uh, organization with which you are probably familiar start all it, it it's interesting it started only in January of 2013 the National Federation of uh, Temple Sisterhoods and this began initially just as an as an organization in one synagogue in Washington D.C. Um, the uh, the principal mover and shaker of that her name was Carrie Simon. Uh, and she established this, this uh, eventually this umbrella organization for all of the growing number of reform congregations in the United States. And their principal mission was, as you can see here, was for the betterment of their, uh, of their seminary and of their synagogues. And the early projects, as you can see, promoted uh, Hanukkah parties and Purim parties and beautifications of their synagogues. And they also raised money for their, uh, for, 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 as I said, for their seminary in, uh, in Cincinnati.
And it is now that we come to the beginning. And um, and as I said here, it's a little bit heretical, but I did a little paraphrase. In the beginning, Solomon Schechter created conservative Judaism. And America was a teeming chaos of immigrants from Eastern Europe. And the Ruach of Solomon hovered over the chaos. And Solomon said, let my Matilda help bring organization among these wandering Jews. And Matilda, whoops. And Matilda brought organization to the women and Solomon saw that it was good. And here we have Solomon Schechter here. Um, uh, and, I'll, and Solomon Schechter, um, for those of you who know, um, was a Molda he was a Moldavian born uh, rabbi. He was a tremendous, he was a tremendous scholar and he moved to London uh, where he was going to study in the British Museum and he was going to go study at the Jews College in London. Uh, before moving, he had traveled throughout Europe and he studied and he studied at the famous uh, Berlin Hochschule for the Wissenschaft des Judentums, where he developed also this idea of a critical approach to, Ju to Judaism. He then moved, as I said, to, to England and where he studied under the tutelage of Claude Montefiore. And then one day in the library of the Jews College, he met a young woman from Breslau, and her name was Matilda Roth. And they became very attached to each other very, very quickly and were married in 1887. Um, Matilda herself grew up in an orphan's, a whore orphan's home in Breslau. You recognize that name, obviously, which was, of course, a center of Jewish learning. And she wasn't an orphan, but uh, she, well, she was an orphan because both of her parents had died. She had an older brother who, uh, who, who could not care for her. So that's why she grew up in an orphan's home. But she also studied herself at the Breslau Teacher Seminary. And she taught for a few years. And then she moved to London where she was going to go and study in the, you know, the great libraries there. And, and of course, as I said, she met this, this brilliant young scholar, Solomon Schechter. They were married. And within a, a short period of time, they, uh, they had three children. And then the Schechter home in, uh, in England, in, in London, uh, and, and Cambridge actually, and then London, what became the intellectual center for all of the Jewish elite in, uh, the who, who traveled in and out of London, who lived there and tra traveled in and out. But what I want to say about Matilda, over and above the fact that you know we we always talk about Solomon Schechter and what a great scholar he was, Matilda Matilda's own scholarship and her own intellect has often been uh, has has often been un, uh, undersold. She herself had a tremendous facility for languages. Uh, she did very important translations from 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 German to English very elegant, very, very elegant English prose that she had learned while, uh, while already in Breslau, she had already begun to study English. She certainly fine-tuned fine, fine -tuned it when she lived in London. She did translations for, in, oh, she did translations for Heinrich Heine, the great poet. And by the, and she was also credited by uh, probably the greatest biographer of Mel Skult, who was the greatest biographer of Matilda Schachter, she actually edited all of Solomon's writings and his beautiful prose is actually attributed to Matilda. So they, so the call came out to, to Solomon Schechter um, that, the, that the, the Jewish Theological Seminary in, in New York was in desperate need of a new, a new spiritual head. And Solomon was, was summoned to the, the um, to, to America. And as was written by um, Ismar Shorsh, uh, the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, uh, back in the early 2000s, he wrote this actually, this beautiful article about Matilda and, and Solomon uh, that came out in Outlook magazine. Um, and he said here, I, which I think is really, he really pinpoints it, that Matilda Schechter, along with her husband, 
gave birth to conservative Judaism. If we give Solomon Schechter credit for shaping the American synagogue, founding the United Synagogue and creating the rabbinical assembly, then we must also acknowledge that Matilda, she Matilda Schechter for founding Women's League for Conservative Judaism. Our movement was built by a married couple. And, uh, and the next paragraph, I don't have time to go into it, but here it also talks about Schechter's reverence for women and female scholars and how even in the Middle Ages, women, there were female Scott copyists who were copying manuscripts. And he said, he one medieval copyist had written, I beseech a female copyist, I beseech here, right here, I beseech the reader, whoops, I beseech the reader not to judge me very harshly when he finds that mistakes have crept into this work. For when I was engaged in copying it, God blessed me with a son, and thus I could not attend to my business properly. So here we have with the foundations of the conservative movement here in the United States, we have a, a very, very gifted couple who is credited with really reinvigorating what will become conservative Judaism in the United States, and they will basically serve and cultivate and nurture, and they and their, and their, and their colleagues and their friends, this huge mass of Jews who are coming in for, from Eastern Europe, who are not at all attracted to the reformist tendencies in, in Judaism, and are looking for a kind of Judaism that will retain Jewish traditionalism but at the same time, we'll, we'll begin to conform to some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of mo modernity. Um, so let me move on here. So as I said, um, Solomon Schechter, who was the really the grand architect of conservative Judaism in the United States and the founder of the United Synagogue. In 1913, at their, at their um, inauguration, the inauguration of United Synagogue, and as you can see, there are 25 congregations now that were beginning to develop throughout the United States of, of uh, these conservative congregations. And he developed this, uh, his opening address. And he said in his address, it should be the duty of the union to make its influence felt with regard to the religious education of women, which is sometimes so woefully neglected in so many old congregations. It is through them that we will reach the children in a country like America, where husbands are busy all week. It is through them that dietary laws will be observed in our homes. I would even suggest that the union assign a certain portion of its work to women and give them a regular share in its activities. They can become more than an auxiliary to us, indeed helpful in many respects, whereas conditions are in this country, their influence is more far reaching than that of their husbands. And this out of the mouth of Solomon Schechter, understanding the power of women as as people as, as those who can influence. Now, what I would like to say here as a, as a caveat here, and it is um, it is a, a a myth that people continue to maintain. And you know we you know we talk about this when we talk about our families, our families that go back generations, about how we are so much less educated than our forebears. And the reality is that that is, it's the exact opposite. And women, the in particular women who came to the United, it's also true of men, you know, unless, you know, unless they were, unless they had spent some time in yeshiva, their Jewish knowledge was negligible. They knew some, they, those who went to yeshiva, they knew Talmud, they didn't really know Bible. They knew Bible from, you know, when they would, when they would read it in, in the, in the synagogues, but they never, the systematic study of Bible was certainly not part of the yeshiva world. Women who came here were woefully, woefully educated about Judaism. They knew, you know, very basic, minimal kinds of, of knowledge that women would have to have to run a Jewish home. They, they knew about Kashrut, 
they knew a little bit about about some of the holidays and how to observe them but their their very woeful lack of of knowledge they certainly could not read hebrew most women's prayer books were in Yiddish at the time. They read these 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 books that were called Tachinas that were written in Yiddish, and most women were also not Hebraically knowledgeable, so they could not at all read, you know, read any of the classical texts in in the originals. And whatever they knew about Judaism, they had just sort of picked up episodically at some point, unless. They were, you know, like Yentl happened to live in a house where, you know, they could, they, their, their father took them under their wing and studied with them and, and were able to give, you know, to disseminate, in, you know, knowledge to their job, to their daughters, where otherwise, you know, they would not have, you know, they would not have access to that in Eastern Europe women, girls went to public schools, they studied other things, but they did not study. They did not study any kinds of classic, they did not have classical, what we would call classical Jewish knowledge. So now that Solomon has, um, has made this, this proclamation that there should be a women's organization following his death in 1918, it then became the task of Matilda to carry on his his mission. And so, as you all know, we hear this every year when, or when we study about, you know, when we, when we celebrate Women's League Shabbat sometime in January, perhaps someone will talk about when Matilda Schechter made her famous address to this group of about 100 women uh, coming from uh, about 23 already established sisterhoods that she, she, uh, she, she made it, you know, gave a, a lengthy speech in which she declared the establishment of an organization was there for the purpose of the perpetuation of Judaism by Jewish women. And here she says yeah, I, that it is for our sake and for the sake of our children that we must educate ourselves with single-hearted devotion in study circles and in our homes. We must cooperate in every way that lies in our power. We have to study our own history, our own literature, and the present day works of Jewish interest. And above all, we must familiarize ourselves again with our own Bible. And it is in this that Matilda has thrown down the gauntlet to Jewish women that they are going to have to educate themselves and they are going to have to take it upon themselves to educate each other and their children in some of this knowledge that has, you know, that they have not previously had access to. And this is going to become the principal mission for Women's League that is going to distinguish it from the other women's organizations that had preceded it. They, you know, as I said, the National Council of Jewish Women was focused on social issues and Hadassah was focused on Zionism and the National Council of uh, the National Foundation of Federation of uh, Women uh, Reform Sisterhoods was going to focus on synagogue life. But Matilda Schechter and that cadre of brilliant women, very eager, energetic women around her, and certainly women who are very well educated, took it upon themselves that their mission, principal mission, was going to be to educate Jewish women. And through the education of Jewish women, they were going to educate their children. And through this process, they were going to perpetuate Judaism. They were going to enrich Judaism and they were going to make conservative Judaism viable and energized and dynamic in the United States. And it is through, and it is at this point that Matilda and those around her, this, as I said, this extraordinary cadre of very talented women um, joined together for the purpose of this, this mission, this, this sacred mission that was to preserve and to enrich Judaism for its membership. So here we have, uh, in the early years of these women's organizations, you can see here the names of some women's, you know, sisterhood was uh, just one of, you know, one, it, be, it became 
probably the most common name for these women's organizations. But but up to this point, you can see there is a large number of names that you know that these women's organizations affiliated with their 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 synagogues called themselves the Ladies Benevolent Society, Women's Auxiliary, uh, the Deborah Society, Sisters of Peace, the Techter of Israel, and the Schwesterbund Sewing Circles. These were all women's organizations, auxiliaries that were affiliated with some with synagogues and um, and eventually many of them came to take on the name of sisterhood. In the early days, they understood that they were going to have to focus uh, focus most of their energies on a few areas. So those areas that uh, became the focus, were the areas of education, of religious observance, the hostess house, which was, of course, the, Jew, the kosher canteen and the student houses that were established first at Columbia University, and then there were there was a student house in Philadelphia that that served served the population of Temple University and the University of Pennsylvania. There was eventually one at Cornell. There was one at University of Michigan, and these. Co these student houses were, were established for the purpose of providing kosher meals and, and programming for Jewish students, uh, Jewish students who lived in New York, also for soldiers at by the by the way, at the end of the war, who Jewish who came through and who were looking for to were looking to connect with other with other Jews, to have kosher meals and to perhaps celebrate some of the Jewish holidays together. Uh, the other, the other committee was what's known as the propaganda committee. Propaganda has taken on a different meaning in today's parlance, but in those days, propaganda merely meant publicity. And through the publicity, the, the publicity was was disseminated by what became the women's women's league speakers bureau. And I, I have to say about these, these, this early group of women who were part of the speakers bureau and these propagandists, these were, this was like a small army, really of, 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 of very dedicated women who got on trains and, and rode these trains sometimes across the country. They rode these to, to, to far reach to California to um to to Iowa to the south to Michigan to Toronto to Montreal these women rode these trains and they they would get off the trains and they would go and they would meet with these women's groups and they would carry with them in their in their their tapestry bags they would carry all kinds of women's league materials that had been prepared for them and they would go and they would these these women would go and they would meet with them and they would talk to them about the importance of their job and how you know what you know some of the fundamentals they taught them how to create create their sisterhoods how to manage their finances how to take minutes how to have some kinds of decorum at the meet and even you know even cursory instruction about robert's rules of order how you could con conduct a meeting how you could collect dues and they also took with them you know as i said in their bags they took these um, women's league publications with them and these early these early phases of women's league publications, as you could see, that were printed. They were beautifully printed. Sometimes they were printed in Yiddish and in English. Sometimes they were printed in Yiddish and English and Hebrew. But these were these were you know these were publications that were meant for dissemination to the children. There were Friday night stories for children that were based upon Louis Ginsburg's. Um, legends of the Jews. There were prayer and blessing cards that were given out to families so that they would know what kind of brachot to say and what kinds of blessings to recite. Later on, um, in, in the next session, where I will talk about this in, enormously important book that was that was published by Women's League. And I'll talk about I'll talk about this at greater length. It was a groundbreaking Book. I cannot emphasize to you enough how significant this book that was published by by Deborah that was written by Deborah Malamed, Malamed was published by Women's League in 1927. It was the 
first book in English for women at which it outlined for women all manner of Jewish observance, holidays, Shabbat, Kashrut, and she went through um, all of the all of the tenets of the of these kinds of observances. And when I I cannot emphasize enough how what a groundbreaking um, manual this was because there was never anything like this in English before in the English speaking world. This book became it went through nine published it went through nine publishings. This was such an important and an important book that rabbis were writing to Women's League from all over the country um, to send them copies of this book. There were in in Europe. Um, People were writing to them from Europe to send them copies, and they were asking for this book to be translated into other languages. Another, uh, which I will talk about in, in, in next week, next week's session, The Adventures of Katantan, again, a groundbreaking work because it was the first books, book that was written for children in English. There were never any storybooks for children, Jewish children, that were written in English. It, Katan, and Katantan, which first came out in Women's League Outlook and Stories, was eventually published in a book. But I, let me, let's just look at some of the projects that these the education committee embarked upon uh, during these early years. As I, as, I, as I had said before, they had this handbook of duties, prayers and blessings, a calendar with biblical quotes of Friday night stories, Kashrut pamphlets, Kiddush cards, Passover and Hanukkah records that were produced by students of the Jewish Theological Seminary. These, re these were records that were made with songs, Passover songs. For initially, they were Passover songs and later on Hanukkah songs that were made onto a record that people could play at home so that they could learn to, they would learn the songs of some of these, uh, of, of these holidays. These became, th these records were a very important uh, resource for, for Women's League and the minutes are filled with requests over and over again about how many copies of these records were sold to, 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 to this family and to this synagogue and to this community. Um, a, a very, uh, one of the, uh, an ongoing source of, of discussion in, in Women's League and was the source of a number of written resources were articles and resources about the Christmas versus Hanukkah issue that was, you know, that became much more prevalent in the United States as Jewish children were increasingly, you know, uh, surrounded by all of this, this, this Christmas paraphernalia, and which was very attractive to them. And, 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 the, and, and Women's League understood the importance of being able to combat, you know, uh, to, to present a positive, uh, a positive and enticing um, view of Hanukkah and its practices that would, that would, um, that would ameliorate some of this, um, this great attraction to, to Christmas uh, among Jewish children in particular. And these are those on um, these are these the educational projects where these were all internal, but you can see that even with the communal uh, educational initiatives outside of Women's League, Women's League sponsored for a number of years a radio show in New York. And on this weekly radio show, they had all kinds of programming from, from music and concerts and reading stories and poetry and discussions, live discussions. There were interviews. I suppose there was a, you know, an early form of Terry Gross on uh, Women's League who would do interviews with, with, uh, with, 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 with people who had written books and people who had, you know, were, were espousing some kind of, you know, a, a different, a new understanding or a, a new proposal for how Hanukkah might be celebrated. Um, the women were in settlement houses, began to, um, to, to go and teach in some of these settlement houses, and they would form Bible camps that were there to combat these Christian Bible camps that were run in the summertime, and they would offer 
Jewish Bible camps to Jewish ch Jewish children so that they wouldn't go to the Christian Bible camps in in New York City and you know especially some of the large areas where large concentrations of Jews and Christians live together. Uh, early on, there was they they established a Matilda Schechter Bible class for for young women in synagogues in in, in universities. They established women's league study circles throughout the city and in and, and, and the and far, far beyond New York City. And they would send, they would send teachers out to lead some of these study, these study circles. Um, as I said in the student housing, the uh, women's league members went in to do uh, holiday programming for the students. Um, women's, and then later on, they began a Women's League Institute of Jewish Studies, which they did in conjunction with other Jewish women's organizations, including Hadassah and the Council of Jewish Women. And here is a fun fact, ladies. There was still in the 20s a relatively large number of Jewish farmers, especially in the up, upstate New York area. And they had a number of all kinds of of concerns and they and and also Jewish Jewish women who would go to work in these in these communities members of women's league would go out and meet with these women who are meeting who are who are living on Jewish farms and just help to sort of shore, shore up for them their Jewish identity and to take a little Jewish learning to them it was a very comprehensive it was very aggressive in a good way and it was a very energizing kind of outreach to the community that Women's League took upon itself and always the mission of each of these projects was the initial uh, the initial mission statement of Matilda Schechter, which was to educate Jewish women in their Jewish in their Jewish heritage. Just see here, okay. And so um, the, for a number of years, Women's League at the, at the very beginning um, did, not, did not have, a, have its own publication. Prior to 1930, the United Synagogue Recorder had a special section for, for, for women. Um, right here, had a special section for women. And in this section, uh, which was edited by Carrie Davidson, uh, who is the wife of Israel Davidson, one of the uh, one of the professors at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and Carrie Davidson eventually went on to become the um, the editor of Women's League Outlook. But Women's League Outlook, I and I, unfortunately, I cannot find in any of the archival material what actually prompted the uh, Women's League to take upon itself their own publication. I'm sure it was their dis their determination to make themselves autonomous from the Jewish theological from, from from the United Synagogue, and they wanted to have their own their own organizational uh, organ. Uh, as you can see, the very first issue of Outlook was dedicated to Matilda Schechter, who had died who, who had died in 1925. And it was dedicated to her and all that she had stood for. As I said here, the, the adventures of Katantan, um, as I said, another groundbreaking uh, publication. We'll talk about that a little more next time. But um, this was this, the stories of Katantan emerged from the pages of, of, of Outlook magazine. And, and by the way, in 1955, the Jewish Book Council awarded Sadie Rode Wilderstein, a, a special award for Katantan and for the important contribution that she had made to children's literature and to Jewish culture. But some of the challenges and concerns that the, um, that the women in early, early Women's League had to deal with, as you can see, were the issues of, as I had talked about before, religious observa observance. And that was, as I said, 
Jewish women, women from Eastern Europe in particular, while they might have understood the, you know, the, the had the nuts and bolts of religious observance, didn't know anything really about the backgrounds of these holidays. Why do we observe these holidays? How, do, where do these come from? And so the, this was, you know, this an ongoing, an, an ongoing concern, especially with the immigrant, the immigrant, uh, the immigrant generation and the first generation was to shore up women's knowledge, uh, based Jewish relig uh, religious knowledge and religious uh, observance. Um, one of the ongoing, as, as, as I said, one of the ongoing concerns was the predominance. Remember, Jews were no longer living, they were no longer ghettoed while they lived in, 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 they lived in communities. They now lived within the wider world and the attractions and, uh, of, of, of the Christian community were, were around them. And this was a constant you know, push and pull with especially with, young, with, with younger people was the attraction of Christianity uh, to, uh, to, 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 Jew, to Judaism. Uh, and I, believe it or not, one of the ongoing concerns was that um, early on you know, there was discussion about boys they didn't want boys to participate in confirmation ceremonies that Jewish girls were now had had appropriated from from the reform movement, and uh, girls in conservative in conservative synagogues were having confirmations, and they didn't want the boys do, going to these confirmation classes or even participating in the ceremonies because they were afraid that boys would abandon the bar mitzvah and just. Would would just bypass bar mitzvah and and move on to confirmation and and sort of jettison that form of learning. A very important ongoing issue was maintaining what is known as the Jewish Shabbat as Shabbat because there was a tremendous um, uh, momentum in the in the grander American Jewish community to move Shabbat to Sundays. For the purposes of being able to, um, especially for reasons of commerce, they didn't want to close down their their stores uh, on on the Sabbath. They wanted to not be want to have a, de a separate day of, of Sabbath from 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 the Christians. They did, did not want to make themselves look that different. And there were there there was always some undercurrents of moving Shabbat to. Um, to, to Sunday, but that was never actually uh, and actively actively pursued within conservative Judaism. Nevertheless, there were always undercurrents of this early on. Already, women were concerned about the status of women regarding Jewish divorce and the fact that Jewish women could not initiate divorce. And even in the in the in the nineteen twenties and thirties, this was becoming a, a concern for Jewish women. And even the lack of clergy and Jewish professionals in small communities remained an ongoing concern um, to, uh, to, to, the Jewish, to the Jewish community, to conservative Judaism. And um, a number of synagogues they were beginning to establish in smaller communities still didn't have it didn't have Jewish professionals working. And, they, um, and so they sort of had to make do with what they had. Ongoing concerns at the same time. Um, obviously, during this time, sisterhoods were very hard. Hard. hard uh, many sisterhoods were very hard hit by the depression, and we'll talk about that in in a few minutes. Uh, some of the effects of that. The um, there was still an ongoing concern about the protection of Jewish girls in the white slave traffic, um, which was uh, was was still a big issue at the turn of the uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, especially with immigration. Large numbers of Jewish girls were either kidnapped or enticed. Sometimes young girls traveling by themselves were sometimes met at the docks by Yiddish-speaking couples that would tell them they're going to get them a, a good situation. They're going to find them a husband. They're going to find them a wife. And these girls would be taken off to to often un, uh, either to to terrible working conditions and sometimes even to brothels in other parts of the world. There's a very large community, believe it or not, of Jewish prostitutes in Argentina, Buenos Aires. There's in fact a seg there's a part of a cemetery in Buenos Aires that is there for Jewish prostitutes because 
Jewish girls were brought in by these 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 Jewish men who had come there them by themselves. But the ongoing uh, the ongoing problem of white slave traffic was of very important was concern to women in Women's League as well. Um, they were concerned with the impoverishment and the persecution of the Falashas, the, the Ethiopian Jews in Ethiopia, and they even established a school there. And of course, the growing political turmoil in the Yeshuv in British Mandatory Palestine, we'll get into that in a little while, the rising fascism in Europe that they are seeing and, and growth, the, really the exponential growth of anti-Semitism in the United States between 1919 and World War II. And it's during this period of anti-Semitism, which, which is really the height, the worst period of anti-Semitism in the United States, where you see the imposition of quotas and public discrimination against Jews and in, in jobs and in, in the universities, et cetera, et cetera. And all while this is going on, there is a just a drumbeat of this terrible deterioration of living conditions for the large, still large number of Jews who have remained behind in Eastern Europe. So these are all of the concerns and challenges that this young organization of Women's League, over and above all of their very ambitious projects to educate women and to educate their children, they're also other directed in problems outside of their own synagogues in their own homes of, the, of, of a world that seems to be, you know, seems to be falling apart. Um, I found this and I thought that this was, um, I, I, I called Corey to tell her about this because I found this in the United Synagogue Recorder. And I think this for me, I just couldn't stop laughing. This was, uh, and there was a segment of the United Synagogue Recorder that was devoted to, to women's league, to sisterhoods. And every issue of, had a, a segment called what our sisterhoods are doing. And in the in this, you know, sisterhoods would write in from all over the country and they would say, well, we have just bought, you know, we've, we just painted the out, we just paid for the exterior of the synagogue to be painted. We have just painted the interior of the synagogue. We've just bought a hundred sidorim for the synagogue a hundred machzorim for the synagogue. We have, we have bought new desks for the Hebrew school. We've set up these parties for the kids in the Hebrew school. A number of sisterhoods actually said that we have retired the mortgage of our, we have raised enough money that we have retired the mortgage of our synagogues. But what I found to be really interesting here uh, was this, Sisterhood in, in Wilkes-Barre, they, they sent in all of the various projects they, they did and what the kind of money that it yielded for the sisterhood, for the, the sister could, could, could then give to the synagogue for its upkeep. But what I would highlight it here, I, was, I found this hysterical. If you can see here, bake sale, seven women, $217. Now, I want you to imagine your synagogue where you have seven women baking cakes and in contemporary money, you're talking about close to $4,000 just for this bake sale in this synagogue. I was just struck, enormously struck by, by hysterical about these seven women baking all of these cakes and raising a huge amount of money for their sisterhoods. But over and above all of the other things that these women were doing and they're studying Bible and they're teaching themselves, they're teaching themselves to read and teaching themselves, you know, how to get through the seat door. They're also just in this extraordinary, uh, you know, drive to raise money to better their synagogues and to raise money. And here you've got these seven women baking cakes. All right, now we're getting into the area of Ein Kol Hadash. So early sisterhood finances. 1918, per capita dues, 10 cents. And then in 1925, 1928, they attempted to raise the per capita dues to 25 cents. 
And you can see my little, my imagery here. This is exactly what happened. When they decided they were going to raise the hue and cry from sisterhood throughout the country was so extraordinary that they absolutely put that to rest. Uh, in 1925, someone had proposed a per, rather than a, a per capita dues to have a flat tax. That also didn't go. That didn't go. And then it's very interesting. Even in the beginning of the Depression, sisterhoods, they, they, they went up, Women's League raised per capita dues to 20 cents. But the agreement was at that point that 50% of whatever was raised would be returned to then ext extant branches. Uh, with one exception, they did give relief to the New York branch because the New York branch, because of where they lived, was so involved in so many external projects outside of outside of their own sisterhoods and their synagogues that they were really, especially during the Depression, they were they were providing tremendous support for all kinds of other social uh, social uh, entities in the New York area. And so only New York was given a reprieve on this. But as I said, they were they were they were really uh, struck very hard. And even then, sisterhoods were um, were always asking for. And I have to tell you, reading through the minutes, especially in the '30s, page after page of sisterhoods either unable to pay either unable to pay their 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 dues either per capita or ask for great reduction in their per capitas because, because they just could not afford to pay it. Um, and this was an ongoing concern, for, especially, as I said, from 1930 through about 1935. Um, another issue that the sisterhoods were, were, um, were constantly fighting about with the synagogues, even then, even though they were financing the Hebrew schools by and large, and they were paying, sometimes even paying teachers salaries, and they were paying for the, you know, the, for the books and the resources, sometimes buying desks, sisterhood members still had to struggle and to scream to be seated as members on the Hebrew school boards. This was still an ongoing concern for women who were doing all of this work, but yet who had no voice about how their money was going to be spent. Um, Corey, should I stop here and ask for questions? Hold on. Yes, please. Um, and also note, Lisa, um, that we have 13 minutes left. What? <laughs> <laughs> Well, remember, we took up some time at the beginning. Okay, so let's let's um, let, uh, can you stop the PowerPoint or are there yep. questions? Can you see me here? We can see you, but we can't see anybody. We, um, uh, I opened stop. up the chat. Thank you. Um, so are there are there there you go. Um, do we have some questions? You can either put it in the chat or you can just raise your hand. Um, Mona, I see your hand. Uh, I just wanted to share, um, Lisa, you shared about how the families over in Russia or Germany were try, you know, poor families were trying to get a better life for their daughters and they were tricked into going to Argentina. There actually is a book by Talia Karner called The Third Daughter. That's all, I mean, historical fiction, but right, it's historical fiction. Yeah. But yeah, obviously it's she, based on the same. Yeah, she, yeah, she talks on that. Yeah. Um, that I, I, and it was, and it was a significant number. It wasn't overarching, but it was particularly preyed upon young girls traveling by themselves. Right, and right, very right. often, you know, young girls were often 13, 12, 13, 14 year old old girls were, were put, you know, sent off by themselves to go live with a, a family member in, in America. And they didn't make it. Yes, the Reformed Temple Sisterhood uh, was January 2013. Anything else? So, Lisa, can we kind of, run, uh, you know, sort of just summarize yeah. up and we'll have to figure out what to do with all the other information. Okay. All right, let me just let me just move forward here. Okay, let me get out of this here for, wait a minute. 
Okay. Okay, here's the incorporation, state of New York, 1931, signed by then New York governor, Franklin Roosevelt. And you can see down here what he talks, it, it is actually- You have to share it's, again, Lisa. You have to oh, share okay. again. Okay, wait a minute, I'm sorry. And we have 10 minutes. Oh, Corey, come on. Um, share. Click on share screen on the bottom. I'm looking, but I'm looking for the, I'm looking for the, uh, oh, here we go. Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay. You can see here what uh, Roosevelt, you know, or what the, what it says here. Um, and, and they they state specifically when they sign up for their charter what their ob what their objectives are, and it's and their objective is to the advancement of traditional Judaism, to further Jewish education among women, to create and foster Jewish. So the even in their in their articles of incorporation, it was the mission of Women's League for the for the for the, uh, preser the preservation of Judaism and the advancement of Judaism and, and the education of its members. In the here, you can see, we will see here in the yeshuv many of the activities that the that that women's league um, that women's league embarked upon. Um, most importantly, was the providing for a synagogue uh, for conserv for the conservative movement in the in uh, in 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 the yeshuv, and they helped to finance it along with United Synagogue. This um, here. Um, in 1939, at, 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 the, at the Women's League Convention, they actually protested. They sent a very vocal pro protest to the President of the United States uh, at that point, um, Franklin Roosevelt, and they protested the white paper by, by Britain, which very much curtailed at, an important, at a very devastating time for Jews, the immigration of Jews to Palestine. The earliest conventions um, you could, Women's League for uh, for a number of years held joint meetings with United Synagogue. Their first joint meeting was held in 1925, where they met with, in separate sessions, and uh, and then they came together for the last session. Their last joint session was in 1934, um, and then their first solo convention was in 1935. Uh, 1939, they with the World's Fair, they did the Temple of Religion, and they did the introduction of the Jewish Home Beautiful that I'll talk about next time when we get to the session on publications. But you all know about Jewish Home Beautiful and those, those tables. Um, Matilda Schechter's legacy, uh, when she died uh, and in, in 1925, the 24, um, after a very long illness, the um, they determined that there was going to be a Women's League Shabbat every year around the time of her birthday, which by the time, by the way, is in no in December usually, and at the at the end of at the end of Kislev, it has now been moved in the present day to the time that the organization was founded in the mid in in mid January. But you can see here is the um, the 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 eulogy that was that was uh, read by Henrietta Zold at or, or written for because she was in 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 the in Palestine at the time when Matilda died but she talked about Matilda and how her how her how much she loved to 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 um to to make things beautiful and how important the beautification of her Jewish home was and through that through the beautification of Jewish custom and tradition uh, through the war, um, there was no convention during the war um, because travel was difficult, but you can see that the Women's League was very much involved and sisterhoods were very much involved in the war effort. Uh, Dora Spiegel did these these chats in Women's League out, Outlook that were meant to sort of replicate the president, President Roosevelt's fireside chats where she would talk about the war effort and what sisterhoods would have to do. And you can see many different activities that women, that women's league, that sisterhoods participated in, in first aid, home nursing for workers, air raid war, war, Red Cross workers, 
um, synagogue social halls became emergency hospitals. They set up kosher kitchens in their synagogues. They ran blood drives. Sisterhoods provided made massive donations. They sold stamps and war bonds. They very much the the full F, much of the effort of Women's League during those years over and above with just the maintenance of their sisterhoods through the, through the war years was to aid and abet the war effort because they knew that this war had to come to an end even before they knew about the utter devastation of the war at the end. They did not yet really realize the extent of what it was going to do in Europe. Post-war initiatives, we'll have to talk about some of those next time. Um, but you can see they are going to really, they're going to branch out. They're going to expand their educational initiatives. In 1947, uh, Sarah Cussey is going to write a, a guidebook in a printed form, which we'll talk about next time, um, telling sisterhoods how they can run their meetings and you know, point by point, Robert's Rules of Orders, how to take minutes, et cetera, et cetera, now in a book written in English for all sisterhood presidents to have and pass on so that they could run orderly meetings. Uh, they set up their first leadership training and then the second, and you could see how it grew exponentially from 1948 to 1949. In 1948, there are 452 women. By 1949, almost 1,300 women. They developed new areas in, of departments of which some of which you will recognize, adult education, Judaica shops, um, library and publications, parliamentary, an NGO was appointed to the United Nations. And at this point, they introduced in 1952, a Devar Torah that women's, that members were to read at the beginning of each meeting as a means of demonstrating again, we are an organization of learning and before we commence with business, we have to talk Torah. They introduced league notes, which were sent to, to sisterhood presidents with all manner of information about new initiatives from, from Women's League, instructional sheets to, to women and activity chairs. In 1950, they hired their first professional executive director prior to that. Um, it was a woman, you know, someone who had some kinds of secretarial skills, but now they realized they needed to have a professional who could now interface with other executive directors of other organizations. They established trainers. And at that point in 1967, Outlook Magazine was no longer a subscription, but was now going to be sent to all members of the homes. And the conventions, um, with the Eleanor Roosevelt spoke at 19, the 1941 convention. By 1943, there, as I said, there were no conventions during the war. So they had, they had conferences throughout the United States because people couldn't travel. And Doris Spiegel, who is the president, set a hookup, a radio hookup, in which she talked to all of the sisterhoods at these conferences throughout the United States where, they, where she gave an address and they were able to somehow connect with each other during the war. 1946 was their first biennial convention. And in, um, and in 1964, their first biennial convention was in Jerusalem where they were addressed by Golda Meir and they had a reception with the with the Prime Minister of Israel, Levi Eshkol, uh, and at that point, 150 members um, were able to visit Israel for that. Obviously, it was a, you know very expensive and cost was a big. But you could see in 1952 here that they they dele the convention was thousand delegates, which at that point was the largest number to date. Lisa, um, can yeah. you can you stop the share and and kind of uh, summarize up because we've got it's nine fifteen eight fifty nine. Okay, okay. Um, oh, what am I going to do here? Just stop share. Well, I know that. I'm just. I know I'm doing stop share. I'm just looking to see what I'm going to. Can I just just quickly? I just want to do one more. Okay. Okay. Corey, you are a tough mask taskmaster. I have to tell you, um, I, I got you knew that. You knew that. I knew that. In your words, Lisa. Well, I want to show them the Torah fun stuff here. I don't know if I can get to it. Okay, 
Um, stop your share and, and just okay, get stop share. Um, I'm going to have to, the next time, I'm going to have to run through some of this because some of this history is so important. Um, I think. I'm, I'm hoping that what I have shown, what I have, what I've demonstrated through this is that when this mass of Jewish women came from Eastern Europe, this was a really, this was a, a, an amorphous mass of women who came from all over the place, different dialects of Yiddish, different, you know, they had different customs. Um, they were, they were relatively, they were relatively un, unschooled. Um, at least in, in Judaics, they were um, they they had very limited knowledge of 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 Judaism, and if you look at the trajectory of Women's League and what its mission has been, to um, wait, a minute, I got to get in here. Let me get into here so I can see you talk. So I can talk to you. Is this here? Am I here? Here I go what the trajectory was of the mission, which was ongoing and never ending, was this notion of educating Jewish women because the purpose of this was Judaism is, Judaism is over and above everything else that it is. Judaism is a religion and we have a rich religious tradition which cannot be lost. And up until you know, the, the 20th century, that was the preserve of a very small number of men. And it was basically not accessible to other people, except, as I said, epi episodically. And the mission of, Jew of Women's League was that this was going to be egalitarian, it was going to be democratic, and that Jewish learning was going to be an, was going to be an option that was there for all women, no matter who they were, no matter what was their level of knowledge, that every Jewish woman would be able to, would have access to learning, she would be able to push herself, and she would be able to enrich herself and nurture her children in her home, and through that, preserve Judaism. And Women's League played an invaluable part in this. And I think that our, our, the story has been very much undertold, not only by United Synagogue, but by the seminary. And, um, and even, even in contemporary Jewish histories, I have to tell you, um, it was with real gray, rich and a storied history. And we have to embrace it and we have to retain it and we have to learn it and we have to continue to tell it because it's through this, it's through the power of our organization that we're still here today. And when you think about the changes, about these women who kept Women's League going and Matilda Schechter, you know, when, you know, when the, the all bets were off and then she died and, and Fanny Hoffman, kept that organization going through the early years when they had lost their leader and the early stages of these women. And then from 1928 to 1945, when Doris Spiegel kept Women's League going and on track during the during World War II. And then in 2000, when Debbie Goldich kept Women's League alive through the pandemic, you know, through, you know, it took women well, you know, the right women at the right time who had the grit and the foresight to understand what Women's League needed. But what's important about Women's League, and it just cannot be forgotten, is that Women's League is really not about the leaders. Women's League is about the members. Thank you, Lisa. And it's, it's the soldiers in the trenches that do the fighting. You know, you've got the Patton and you've got the Eisenhowers and you've got all these people who make the grand plans, but it's those people that get out there and fight the fight on a daily basis who have kept this organization going. And while we have to, you know, we have to pay tribute to our leaders and we have to really respect their accomplishments, more than that, we need to respect the accomplishments 
of all of the women out there every day who do these little tasks that they don't want to do, who, you know, who, 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 who raise money for their Hebrew schools, who, you know, sell their, their Torah fund pins, who, you know, who every day, these little tiny, these little tasks, making telephone calls, writing letters, you know, giving their divre Torahs. These are the women who are keeping Women's League alive, and it is an organization that is worthy of their effort, and it's an organization that's worthy of a daily appreciation of it. Lisa, and thank you to all of you for, for that. Lisa, thank you. Um, I so much information. I knew it would be too much, and I loved every bit of it, and I look forward to our next session, which will focus on uh, Publish or Perish. And we'll talk more in depth about some of the publications that were just such milestone publications. Um, and, you know, to add to what Lisa had said, it's you, it's everybody who came tonight and it's your sisterhoods and the women in your sisterhoods who are responsible for the health of Women's League. And we have to we have to know what Women's League is so that and its history so that we can continue, continue on and be strong in the future. So good night to everyone. Thank you very much. November 7th. November 7th is the next one. You'll be receiving information on it. And uh, we will you will not, you will just learn so much. Uh, we'll probably have too much for that. Lisa will give us too much for that date as well, but it's okay. Um, we have a wonderful teacher and I'm so glad that Lisa has shared her knowledge and her, her uh, teaching skills with us. Uh, we have a wonderful best wishes to all of you for a Shana Tova and May 5785 it's a big wish, but may it be a year of peace, joy, and fulfillment, and the return to all of us of the hostages. So have a good evening. Thank you for joining us, and hopefully we'll Thank see you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say I got a quick correction. I got a quick correction from Rabbi Ellen, and I, you know, I know that women doesn't Women's League does not sell Torah fund pins. I know that that's, 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 that's what they get. That's what they get for their donations. I understand that. But that was just because I, I was just <laughs> rushing through. So that was, but yes, we, we're not in the jewelry business, as Gloria Cohen would say. Very good, Lisa. Jewelry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Hello, everybody, and goodbye, Tova. everybody. Bye. Bye. Shana Tova. Shana Tova.